Good evening, everybody. Nice to see you. Uh, it's uh, going to be a great night. We're going to talk about faith. I want to give everybody a minute to log on, and uh, we're going to talk tonight about what I feel to be the most important subject, uh, I, at least the most needed subject in the Bible today, is the issue of faith. Uh, so as I'm waiting for people to log on, um, we're in Tennessee now, right now. My wife's in Florida, so uh, we're in two different states right now. So uh, I've had some extra time with nobody in the house with me just to do some study. Um, I've been alluding over the last many months about doing a conference on faith. Hey, Christina, God bless you. I see you. we've uh, Adam, God bless you, brother. Uh, I see whoever comments. So if you don't comment, I don't see you, but I see you guys. God bless you. Um, I've been alluding to the the subject of faith for a lot of months and weeks. And in fact, I did a conference recently in Tennessee on faith. And uh, we did about, it was either seven or eight sessions. Uh, hey, Heldon, God bless you, brother. We did seven or eight sessions on faith. And at the end of the conference, the last half of the conference where I really got into teaching on faith, the videos were all lost. So... Um, it was it was upsetting in, in a sense, and then I had an invitation. Hey, Mark, God bless you. Miguel, I see you. God bless you, sir. Um, I had an opportunity to go to another state in Iowa and do a conference on faith and healing, and I did another teaching after the Tennessee conference on faith, and I was pumped up because the pastor was recording, and I even gave the testimony while I was doing the seminar on faith. I did my testimony of losing the last messages, and it was the, only the second time now that I was preaching on these subjects. Well, I got on the airplane in Chicago. Hey, Luann, God bless you. I got on the airplane in Chicago to come back home, and the pastor of the church I did the seminar in in Iowa called me and said, you're not going to believe this. We lost all of the video or audio on your, your teachings on faith. And he was obviously disappointed, but only half as much as I was. So now I've done these teachings two different times, two different places, and the footage got lost both times. So I went home, and I started thinking, either this is demonic and the devil doesn't want me getting any... Hey, Vanessa, God bless you. Or I, I began to question, God, am I not supposed to release these things yet? Is this premature? Is And so I began to question. But over some time, it's like I've been just keeping these subjects to myself, maybe talking to friends on the phone, and I came to the place where I said, this is too precious for me to keep quiet anymore. I feel like I've had the, the most significant spiritual breakthrough of my entire life in, in Jesus, and I've had a, quite a few. And I feel like the subject of faith is so important, so critical. It touches everything in the gospel. And if we miss it here, I, I, you can be strong in faith. I mean, in prayer. You can be strong in holiness. You can be strong in preaching. You can be strong in witnessing. You can be strong in whatever area you're, you're strong in. But if you come up short in faith, I tell you what, you won't go anywhere and when, when we're talking about the deeper things of God, all of the deepest things of God, all of the biggest blessings in God, spiritual blessings I'm talking about, are only apprehended by faith. And so, Julie, Tracy, God bless you. I love you guys. So, I want to start off with this verse, Luke chapter 18, verse 8. And I've always thought this verse was so peculiar. And, and the years gone by when I used to come across this verse, I would say... What's the what, what am I missing? Why does this seem so peculiar? It it's almost stands out like it's... I'm like, really? That's the issue? Uh, you're probably familiar with the verse. Uh, Jesus said, When he, the Son of Man, comes, uh, will he, when, he, when he comes, will he find faith on the earth? That's Luke 18, 8. When he, the Son of Man, comes, will he find faith on earth? Now, I would say to myself, of all the attributes or the things that Jesus Christ questions... Uh, about what will, will they be there when he returns. Why faith? I'm thinking, and now I understand, but back then I did, I, I thought, man, wouldn't be, like, will there be holiness? Will there be truth? Will there be you, you, love? Uh, he, he questions those things in different passages as well, but particularly the Son of Man, he says, when he comes, will he find faith? That's what he's looking for when he comes in, in a church that isn't full of faith. Believers that aren't full of faith are cheating themselves out of the most amazing blessings uh, to be apprehended in the Word of God. So I'm going to try to go slow tonight. Because I have so much I want to say, but I'm going to try to go slow because I'm going to break these down. I'm going to start going live more often to, to give these in uh, slower, more methodical uh, statements so that um, 
those of you, and I, and I know I'm only ministering to, a, 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 I don't know how many people, but uh, this isn't for the masses. This is for a couple hundred people that watch these videos. I really want to take my time for you because I have an objective uh, in these teachings. I want to build your faith. I want to build your spiritual man. I want you to feel strong and that you have basis on which to place your faith in God. Um, I feel like there's been a shortage uh, of preaching and I'm as guilty as any preacher because I've been preaching for over 10 years and there has been a shortage of preaching in the subject or areas of faith more than any other subject. And I don't just mean faith in God's existence. If you think that's what faith is, you're, you're missing it. Faith. When I say faith, I'm, I'm talking about that thing within you that believes God's word so much so that you act upon it before you see any proof of it, you act upon it because your faith is the proof that when you act upon God's word, it will surely come to pass. Gary, God bless you. Thank you, brother. So we want to cover this methodically because I don't just want to pass off information or preach a sermon. I'm, I'm not into that right now. I am into building the faith of the church. I want you to have strong faith and to have a basis. So uh, the only way that you can have strong faith is to have a basis for your faith. In other words, uh, I, I forget who said it, but I think it was F.F. F. Bosworth. And by the way, I would strongly recommend a book to you called Christ the Healer, which I found recently and just in the last couple of maybe a month or so. And uh, man, it just it just confirmed everything that I had been learning from the scripture. I couldn't believe how how biblical and sound this book was on is healing for today. It's Christ the Healer. Um, and I think one of the statements that he made in, in his book was, uh, I'll come back to that because it just dropped my mind, but Anyway, when it comes to the subject of faith, it can only be built within your soul or your spirit in your mind by hearing. The Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, most of us in our history of being alive on earth, we've heard sermon after sermon or preacher after preacher or statement after statement that Christ saves from sins or Christ died on the cross or uh, uh, God, Jesus is Lord, or we've heard those things literally countless of hundreds of times probably in our life. And, and so it's easier for us to attach our faith to those realities because faith comes by hearing. If you hear it enough, faith can be produced in a person's heart. Because there's so little teaching in the areas um, of, of healing, deliverance, um, and the supernatural, there's so little teaching in regard to it that we just haven't heard. We haven't heard, we haven't been inundated in the, the the truths about healing. Is it God's will to heal? About deliverance, about casting out demons. The things that Jesus said are to be the sign of, of the believer. But because we haven't heard it enough, our faith isn't, isn't strong in those areas. Our, our faith may be very strong in that Jesus died for our sins, but our faith isn't so strong that it's his will to heal. So the only way that I know to get our faith strong in these areas is to hear and to stand really search the scriptures. Ultimately, it's all what the Bible says, not what I say or F.F. Bosworth or anybody else, but to build our faith in the word of God. But because there's so so little teaching along these lines, I think the church is anemic when it comes to the issues of true faith. So I want to build your faith. I want to strengthen your confidence in what God's word really says. And I think once you begin to see how many times and in how many ways God promises us supernatural provision in his word, and he waits and expects the church to step out and, and act upon what his word says before we see the results. So faith is, as, as Hebrews 11 one says, the substance of things that we hope for and the evidence of things not seen. One, one translation of that is faith gives substance to the thing that we hope for. So before there can be faith, there has to be hope. But faith and hope are not the same thing. We have, ex we have exchanged or confused faith for hope. In other words, if we hope for something, we we feel like we have faith for that because we're hoping for it. But no, if hope doesn't turn into faith, then you won't get the thing that you're hoping for. See, faith gives substance to what you're hoping for. So hope is not a bad thing. You first have to hope for something. You may be hoping for somebody's salvation. You may be hoping for a touch from God in your physical, maybe you have a physical illness, or maybe you have a struggle in your marriage, or maybe you have a struggle at work, and you're hoping that God will come and help you. Well, if all you're doing is hoping, as some people say, well, all we can do now is hope and pray. Well, if all you do is hope and pray, your prayers will not get answered because God doesn't promise to answer hopes and prayers. 
He promises to answer faith in prayer. We'll cover that tonight. God only promises to respond and, and help you when you believe and have faith. So faith gives substance or makes what you're hoping for materialize. So if it's only hope, you can hope for healing, you can hope for somebody's salvation, you can hope for a blessing all you want. And maybe out of God's mercy, occasionally he'll, he'll meet you there on your hope. But the idea is that our hope translates into faith. Well, how do you get from hope to faith? You can, oh, and that's where I was going to quote F.F. F. Bosworth. F.F. Uh, F. Bosworth said this statement, Faith can only be produced where the will of God is known. Oh my goodness, what a... Hey, Andrew, God bless you. What an amazing statement. Listen closely to what I said. This, radic, this is a revolutionary statement. Faith can only be produced where the will of God is known. So if you don't know the will of God, you can't have faith. In other words, if you're questioning if it's God's will to save you. I don't know if it's God's will. He can save me if he wants to. Is that how you get saved? If somebody says to you, well, I don't know if it's God's will to save me. He can save me if he wants to. You, you know that person isn't going to get saved with that mentality. Before a person can come to faith that they can be saved, they first have to know God's will in the matter. So what does the Bible say? Well, the Bible says it's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So we don't have to question whether or not it's God's willing, if God's willing to save somebody or if it's you. You don't have to wonder if God's willing to save you. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come. So we have a basis right there in that verse for our faith in salvation. So once the will of God is known, once I know that it's God's will to save me, then I have no no other, uh, no other uh, recourse but to believe God's word that he will save me when I meet the conditions. The, the conditions are simply repent of your sins and believe the gospel. So if the Bible says repent and believe the gospel and you'll be saved, then my only course of action must be believing the word of God and repenting of my sins and that's how I get saved. Well, that same law applies for every aspect of God's blessing. Whether it's, and I'll give you some scripture. I just gave you a, a one example of salvation, for example. Before you can be saved, you must have faith, which means you must believe it's God's will to save you, and that, and that when you meet the conditions and repent and believe the gospel, you will be saved. Because the Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace are you saved through faith. You see that? Through faith. You can't be saved until you come to faith. Again, uh, the next example I'll give you is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Now, before you can be baptized in the Holy Ghost, and by that I mean uh, the Holy Ghost, this is a subsequent event that happens after your salvation where the Spirit of God indwells you and you receive power. Acts 1a says you'll receive power after that. The Holy Ghost has come upon you and be my witnesses. So it's a secondary experience apart from salvation. Uh, I have teachings on that on YouTube. I'm not going to go into that. But you can't be baptized in the Holy Ghost until you have faith. That when maybe you can pray by yourself or maybe somebody's going to lay their hands on you, but you have to believe that when that person lays hands and prays over you, that you're going to actually receive the Holy Ghost. Now, if you're questioning whether it's God's will that you have the Holy Ghost, when that person prays for you, do not expect to receive anything from that person or from God because... Without faith, you cannot receive it. The verse I'll give you is in Galatians chapter 3, verse 2. It says clearly, did you, he the, um, did you receive the Holy Ghost by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? He gives you two, two explanations or two options. Did you receive the Holy Ghost, speaking of the baptism of the Holy Ghost, by the works of the law? In other words, did you go out and do enough good works and then get baptized in the Holy Ghost? Or did you receive the Holy Ghost by the hearing of faith? There's only two options, and we know it's not the works of the law because the law was abolished. We know that. We did the study on that recently. So the only other explanation or option that Paul gives is by the hearing of faith. So how do you receive the baptism in the Holy Ghost? Well, you believe that it's God's will to baptize you in the Holy Ghost. And if you're coming up for prayer to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, or you can do it right at your house. I don't necessarily think there, there's a scripture that says somebody has to lay hands on you. But if you're gonna come to God and ask him for the Holy Ghost, don't expect to receive from God unless you've come to the conclusion that it's his will to give you the Holy Ghost. And if you come doubting or questioning uh, whether or not it's going to happen or whether or not it's his will, you won't receive. And you hear stories of people that have been pleading with God for the baptism of the Holy Spirit for 20 years. 
And yet I read in the Bible where it says that immediately after they, they heard the word of God, they were baptized in the Holy Ghost. Because see, when the early preachers preached in the Bible, in the book of Acts, they preached in such a def definite way as to convince people it is the will of God. And Jesus, how, how much clearer could he make it when he said, God is more willing to give his Holy Spirit to them that ask than we are to give our children bread. So if you haven't received the baptism of the Holy Ghost because you're still questioning if it's his will or if he's still doing it today or are you qualified or you, you need to go back to the scripture to find what the word of God teaches. And you can only have faith to the degree that you know it's God's will. So if you're doubting God's willingness to give you the blessing, don't pray. Don't have somebody else pray. So many people come to the altar, go to a person they feel is anointed, the man of the hour, to get some supernatural touch from them when they are still in their own heart questioning God's willingness to do it or is it even biblical? Let not that man think he shall receive anything from God, the Bible says. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. And the next thing he says, let not that man think he shall receive anything from God. So you can't receive anything from God while you're double-minded. You will be double-minded on things until you see what exactly the scripture teaches in that matter, whether it's salvation. The second example I just gave you is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Until you settle this question, is it God's will? Is it for me? Is, it, is he willing to give me what he promised? And until you approach God on that basis, you will not receive from God. People have been waiting on the answers to prayer for years and years and years. And they think, if I get the next anointed man to pray for me, I'll get the blessing. If I get the next anointed healing evangelist, I'm going to get my healing. You can get your healing at your house. The same God that works in the church or in a conference or in a crusade works right in your bedroom. But he only responds to faith. So until you come into faith and believe, you won't receive. Now, I'm going to cover the verse. Be, 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 write this down just in case I forget to give you this verse tonight. It will revolutionize your, uh, your, your outlook on faith. It's Mark 11, 23 and 24. I, I'm going to probably come to it, so, but just in case I don't. Read that about 100 times because it took me about 50 times of reading that, I think, to actually get what it was saying. Next. Prayer. And matter of fact, we'll go to Mark 11 right now, just so I don't miss it. What about the subject of prayer? Prayer, it doesn't matter how long you pray. It doesn't matter how many words you use. It doesn't matter uh, if, you, if you attend every prayer meeting every day of the week. If you don't pray in faith, your prayer is vain. It's empty. Jesus said, don't think you'll be heard for your much speaking. It's not how much or how long or the repetition or... Uh, even how loud, I know people, some people think if they pray louder, maybe they'll get more results with more fervor. Listen, the only way to get results in prayer is by believing what you're praying. Go to Mark 11. Uh, let me read that to you. It's just so clear there as much as any. There's other chapters I could easily go to to, to confirm this point. But listen to what the Word of God says. Jesus speaking. Ver verse 22, he says, have faith in God. So we know right away what he's talking about. Have faith in God. Remember, he asked, when he comes back, will he find faith? Uh, verse 23, he said, For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say, notice the word say there, that's very important, whoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart. Oh man, if he didn't put that in there, we would have all been prayer warriors. If all we had to do is say it and get the results, we would all be prayer warriors. But he puts this little disclaimer in the middle of the verse. Look, let me say it again, that whatsoever, whosoever shall say to this mountain, whatever your mountain is, it's, it's an it's a allegory. Obviously, we're not to go yell at the mountains. We're to yell at the mountain that's in our life. We're to speak to the mountain. But it's not enough just to speak. It's not enough just to yell. It's not enough to shout. It's not enough to yell and shout and clap and pray and scream every single day for all hours of the day. Unless we believe what we're praying will come to pass. Listen close. Whosoever shall say to this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but, listen, shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. If that verse isn't true, then none of the Bible's true. And I know it is true. Whoever prays, he says, and whatsoever you shall say, whoever and whatsoever, whoever prays and whatsoever you pray, if you believe in your heart, that what you're saying shall come to pass. You shall have whatsoever you say. But notice, 
You have to say before you get it. And you have to believe in your heart. Listen to what he says in the next verse, verse 24. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Well, when do you believe? Before you receive. When do you receive? After you believe. Listen closely. Whoever, what, whatever things soever you desire when you pray, believe you receive them and then you'll get them. You don't get them until you believe them. You, you have to believe. The believing comes before the receiving. How many times we pray and pray and cry and pray and fast and pray and have somebody else fast and pray and we get a prayer chain. I'd rather one person pray in faith than 10,000 people on a prayer chain mouthing words. I would rather just call one person who prays the prayer of faith. If, I'm, if I need a touch in my body, I'm calling the one person that prays in faith over 10,000 people on a prayer chain that are just mouthing the words. Jesus never promises if you get 100,000 people praying, then you'll get what you're asking for. He simply says, you, whatsoever you desire, when you pray, believe, you receive, and you shall have. There is no corporate, no corporate prayer meeting necessary to get answers to prayer from God. God's more willing to answer a prayer than we are to pray. But he gives us this one condition. When you pray, believe. So we believe before we receive and we won't receive unless we believe. Remember, James chapter 1. Whoever prays in anything other than faith, let not that man think he shall receive anything from God. We might not think that's fair. Why would God put this stipulation on us to get prayers answered? My goodness, how easy did he make it? The only requirement is to believe. But see, we, don't, we, we haven't been properly instructed on what God's will is in the church. Is it his will to heal? I can't believe I have to have arguments with Christians over is it God's will to heal today? All who come to him and meet the conditions. I have to argue with Christians. Well, what about Paul's thorn? And what about the... We cast more doubt with the little verses that are exceptions to the rule. And then we've got hundreds of verses that plainly teach us it's his will. And so the church has this double-minded. Is it God's will? Is it not? Should I expect it? Should I not? Does he want to baptize me in the Holy Spirit or did that pass away? Is he willing to heal me now or is this my thorn in the flesh? Listen, if you need a, a touch from God, if you need a breakthrough, if you're suffering from depression, fear, sickness, torment, financial struggles, or whatever your struggle is, if I could tell you anything as your brother in Jesus Christ, find God's word for your situation so that you have a sure and steadfast place to put your, your, uh, 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 to put your faith. So if God's word says it, you can take faith and apply it and then act upon it and expect results. While we are questioning what's God's will, what's not God's will, is, am I in a condition where he can bless me or not or whatever, I believe the enemy's job is full time to cast doubt in our mind. Remember God said, don't eat the tree. What did Satan say to Adam and Eve? Hath God really said? Just casting a little doubt when you're unsure and double-minded, you can't receive from God. So it's important that what we're reading the Bible, we're not reading the Bible as just a rule book, although it contains rules, we're reading the Bible as a book of promises from our Heavenly Father waiting to be apprehended if we would but simply believe what He said would come to pass and then act upon the Word, expecting the result and leaving that to God. The results aren't up to us. The believing's up to us. The results are up to God. I, I'd love to keep going on that concept, but let me give you another example. Ministry. Ministry in the spirit, spiritual ministry, in other words, and the working of miracles. Where, 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 where does the power come from to do those things? Is it just an anointing? Sometimes people are anointed with certain giftings, but the, the Bible specifically says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 5, that he that worketh miracles among you and ministers the spirit to you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Again, he gives you two options. The only option can be by the hearing of faith. Sometimes we think the, 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 the anointing of God or to preach powerfully or to heal the sick or to do whatever thing we think we need to do or that needs done. We think that we need some supernatural power imparted upon us so that then we can go out. I looked at it like that for many years. And it's only now I'm beginning to see the Bible doesn't promise it that way. The Bible, th that's one aspect of it. You can be anointed by the Holy Spirit and gifted to do works in, in 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians 14. One of the gifts listed there is the working of miracles. Another one is the gifts of healing. 
Another one is the word of wisdom, word of knowledge, speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues. Obviously, there are those gifts given in the body. But do you think that those gifts just work automatically by because they're there and that the person that, that possesses that gift still doesn't have to operate in that gift by faith? Do you think just because somebody's gifted or anointed, they can just it just automatically pours out from them? Let me tell you as a minister, as a preacher, I go to the pulpit many times not knowing what I'm going to speak on or what I'm going to say, but by faith I step to the pulpit and some of you that have heard me preach publicly know sometimes I fumble for about two to three minutes. All I'm doing is just trying to find that, that sweet spot, but I start by faith. I don't start because I felt like it. I don't start because the anointing's buzzing out of my ears. I just begin to speak, trusting God that his, his spirit is going to quicken me and he always comes through by the grace of God and quickens me. But it starts with faith. He that ministers the spirit to you, does he do it by the works of No, by the hearing of faith. He must begin, just like receiving the Holy Spirit. Many people can't receive the Holy Ghost and speak with tongues because they're waiting on the spirit to just come and force them into the experience. That's not the way it happens. He that received the spirit among you, he did it by the hearing of faith. In other words, you have a part to play in the activity of God. No matter what that activity, if it's salvation, if it's prayer, if it's receiving the spirit, if it's ministering the spirit, if it's working miracles, no matter what it is, every aspect that God gives us permission and requires the church to act on and demonstrate will require us to do it in faith, to step out and believe God's word. So it's not some automatic thing, a switch. that get, We're not robots. We can't just look and say, I'm waiting on God. I'm waiting on God. Well, we have a whole book of promises called the Bible that clearly show us what God's will is. Once we read the Bible that way as a book of promises that we are to put our faith in and then act upon, suddenly the responsibility is off God doing such and such a thing. And it's on us to act upon what God's word says. Now, the last example I'll give you is healing the sick. So healing the sick, uh, we, we are told in James 5, 15, that it's the prayer of faith that saves the sick and that we're to call for the elders and the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise them up. And if that man's committed sins, they shall be forgiven. What a promise that we never take hold on in the church. The Bible specifically says if any people in the church are sick, they're to do one thing, call the elders. Now, it's your responsibility if you're sick. Don't look for the elders to come find you. The Bible clearly states if you're sick, your responsibility is to call for the elders of the church and those elders are responsible then to anoint you with oil and pray the prayer of faith and the Bible promises as clear as any promise is and the Lord shall raise him up and if he's committed sins they shall be forgiven there's no and if or buts the reason we don't see that verse being corporately carried out is because we don't believe the word as we ought to it's your responsibility, sick person, to call the elders. We say, well, I don't know if the elders are all that anointed. The Bible didn't say they had to be that anointed. The Bible said if you're sick, you call the elders. The elders are then to anoint you with oil and pray the prayer of faith, and the Lord shall raise you up. I believe even if the elder isn't all that anointed, if you do your part and trust God and believe what his promise says, you'll receive the benefit. All of the promises of God are yea and amen. The Lord has exalted his word above his own name. The, the, everything in this world that says will fail, but the word of God will abide forever. My word shall not return unto me void. Once we get God's word on a subject, on an issue, on a need, on anything, we can believe God and our faith can pull down the provision of God. Let me give you a great example. I might go long tonight. I'm sorry. I'm pumped up right now. Let's look at the woman with the issue of blood. This woman said in her heart, if I may but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole of my plague. Now, where did this woman get faith like that? This woman didn't have a Bible. She wasn't born again. She didn't have the Holy Spirit. But yet she said, what did Mark 11, 23 and 24 say? Whatsoever you shall say, and believe and do not doubt you shall have whatsoever you say well this woman the bible says said in her heart if i may but touch the hem of his garment i shall be made whole of my plague the bible says she spent all her money on doctors and was none better but she heard jesus christ preaching and something in her heart believed and she said out of her belief if i touch his garment i'm gonna be whole she fights through the crowd illegally she's bleeding she's not to come near the crowd she's she's risking her life to do this because she said in her heart she already her faith was already set on the subject if i touch him i'm healed she fights through the crowd she 
touches the hem of his garment. And the Bible says immediately, not the next day, not the next month, immediately when she touched, her plague was dried up. That blood ceased to flow. Now, this woman puts a demand on the power of God. And here's the most amazing thing of the story. Jesus said, who touched me? Jesus was completely unconscious of the fact that his power just came out of his body and healed a woman because he didn't lay hands on her, but he knew that virtue went out of his body and did something. So he was aware it went out, but he wasn't aware why it went out or how it was released. This was new to Jesus. He was used to touching people and releasing power to heal them, but he wasn't used to virtue escaping from him. He said, who touched me? Who touched me? This woman trembling, it says, says, Lord, it was me. And when Jesus heard her faith and saw her faith, she said, daughter, he said, daughter, be of good cheer. Thy faith has made thee whole. Not my faith, not my power, not the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Your faith made you whole. What does this teach us? There's a law at work where faith is where somebody speaks from faith and acts from faith, it puts a demand on God's power. Even if, even if in this case, the container of the power was, was totally unconscious that the power was released. She put a demand. She got results from God because her faith put a demand on God's power. When you believe and you say and you act on God's word, you can be assured that God's word will come to pass. On the flip side of that, Jesus went to his hometown and preached the Spirit of the Lord God's upon me because he's anointed me to heal, preach, deliver. But they said, is this not Joseph's son? Do we not know his mother and father? And the Bible says in Mark chapter 6 that Jesus could there do no mighty works. Didn't say he would there, said he could not do any work, mighty works there except he filled, uh, healed a few sick folk or a few people with minor ailments. That is to say, because Nazareth didn't believe that Jesus was the Christ and that he came to heal, deliver, and save, they questioned and doubted him. And the Bible said Jesus could not do the works there that he intended to do. So our unbelief and doubt can restrict the flow of God's promise and power. But our faith and our saying and our acting on the word of God can actually pull down the very blessings and, and promises of God and make them a reality. It's not some automatic thing that comes through the anointing. Jesus was as anointed as they ever came. Remember, the Bible says Jesus received not the Spirit by measure. He had the measureless anointing of the Holy Spirit. We know that from Acts 10, 38. The Bible says how that God anointed Jesus Christ with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. So God anointed Jesus with limitless power. Yet when he came to his hometown, his power was restricted from flowing because of their unbelief. And then you got a woman who just comes to faith all on her own, who moves through the crowd and pulls down God's blessing because she believed God's word. She believed God's messenger. So it is today. These laws are still at work. If we don't believe God's word, we will never receive. Though we cry, we pray, we live holy, we go to church, we can do. There's no substitute. Now, don't think you can live unholy and not pray and not go. To, I'm not saying that you, you can't, you leave those things and not do them. I'm saying do those things, but they're not going to get you the blessing unless you believe, fully believe that it's God's will, it's God's word, it's his promise, and he's not a man that he can lie. And he's given us his word so that we have a sure place to put our faith. So once we know what the word of God says, we have something to put our faith in. Faith is not blind. Faith is believing what God has said. And I can tell you, whatever your case is, there's a scripture in this Bible, if not two or three, that will bear witness and tell you what God's will is in your situation. And then you're obligated to believe. Now, I know everywhere around you, we're steeped in unbelief, in doubt, in negativity, in cynicism, cynical people, and pessimism, and everything's wrong, and everything's... But... Beyond that, shed those things off of you because the word of God is true. We need to let the word of God be true and every man alive. When we find the word of God that meets our case, that tells us plainly what God's will is in the matter at hand, we then can put our faith and then and only then can we act upon the word of God. Now, I want to give you a couple, I don't even know how long it's been, but let me just, hey, Andrew Montgomery, my brother, let me give you this, this scripture. It's so important. Hey, Brianna, Terrence, God bless you guys. So important is this scripture. 
it, it, to me, it, this, this will settle so much in our minds. Um, first, let's, I already told you what Hebrews chapter 11 says, for faith is the substance, or faith gives substance to what we're hoping for. In other words, faith makes our hope materialize. We're hoping for something, but until we believe God for it, we're just hoping. But once we believe God, it changes our hope into a reality. Faith gives substance to what we're hoping for. And then in verse 6, he said, uh, without faith, it's impossible to please God. For those who come to God must believe that he is first and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. In other words, we believe that God will do what God said he'll do. And we approach God on that basis. If God said it, he can't lie, I'm coming for it. When we approach God on that, I'll bust through the crowd if I might but touch him because he's going to do it, what he said he would do because he'll never lie. When we approach God on that basis, we're going to get results. Now, I've looked at James 2. This is the scripture I want to give you. I've looked at James 2. Uh, I mean, as far back as I've been preaching, I can, I can say I've preached James 2 exclusively in the area of salvation. Now, if you, you probably know the chapter, but let's read it real quick together. The, the whole subject of faith without works is dead, being alone. I've always used that in the context of salvation, and, and I'm not saying that's a wrong application. Uh, of course, if you say you have faith and you don't have a good a life of good works, of course it, your, your faith won't get you anywhere. But let's look at it tonight with a different light. What about if, more than just salvation, what about if he's talking about all of his promises? When we begin to see the promises in the Bible, or the Bible as a book of promises waiting to be apprehended. Let me say that again. The Bible is a book of promises waiting to be apprehended by the believer. That's why Jesus said, when he returns, will he find faith? Now, uh, I don't know if I want to crack this worm, but let me just say, this can of worms, but let me say, Jesus said, the Bible says that all men have been dealt the measure of faith, Romans 12, 3. We've all been dealt the measure. The measure is what we would call, some call it saving faith. It's that 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 basic faith that's common to all believers to be to be saved. You couldn't get saved without the measure of faith. In other words, you didn't conjure up faith. Faith, the Bible says Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. He originates it. He brings it to completion. However, we are actively engaged in it coming to completion. But Jesus authored it. He dealt, it says, each man the measure, the, that, that small amount that was enough, the mustard seed enough to be saved and to believe the gospel and to come out of sin. Now, how our faith grows is up to us. How do we grow faith? Well, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. That's why it's important that we hear teachings like this on a more frequent basis. I'm going to try to go live more often. If nothing else, I'll preach the same message a hundred times. We need it. I've been studying faith for 12, like almost 12 months now, that almost exclusively. And, and it's taken me this many months to build my faith in, in certain aspects because I realized I had been taught wrong. I had believed wrong. I haven't believed. I questioned when I should have believed. I questioned. I put ifs if it be God's will in front of things that I shouldn't have. And so it, it, it hindered me from coming to faith. Now I've thrown all of those preconceived notions and I'm going back to the Bible and it's like I've never read the Bible before. It's as if the Bible is a brand new book to me because I'm reading it now as a book of promises waiting to be apprehended by faith. So now if God's word says it and I can establish a truth by two or three witnesses, I have no other course of action but to believe and then act upon it. So now, James 2, when we hear this, this statement, faith without works is dead, it's true that if you say you, you love God and don't follow his commandments, you're just a liar. You're, you're, that's dead faith. But it means much more than that. Listen, if God promises in his word something clear to the believers, to the church, whether it be healing, whether it be deliverance, whether it be blessing of any kind, if God promises us those blessings and we don't act Upon those those promises, meaning we step out in faith like the woman with the issue of blood, saying, if I do what God said, I will get the answer. And take, taking the risks necessary, because the life of faith is risky, you take the risks necessary to step into the, the place where God can answer his word, perform his word. Sometimes we sit back and say, well... When I know God's, if I knew it was God's will, I'd go pray for that person in the wheelchair. If I knew it was God's will, I'd do X, Y, Z. Well, let me tell you, the, the, the word of God is the will of God. How do you know the will, will of God? By the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word. The only way to build your faith is to look into this book of promises and find God's heart on every issue. When we establish it's God's will, then we act upon it in 
and, and no compromise, no holding back, believing that he'll do what he said he will do. And when we believe and act upon our belief, then we get results. If we don't act first, we wait on evidence first. See, faith is the evidence. If we're waiting on evidence to then step out, we're missing it. All the evidence we need to know God's will is found in the scripture. The Bible is all the evidence we need to know God's will. Once the word says it, you can't be like Gideon and say, well, I'll put a fleece out. And if the dew is on the fleece and not on the ground, then I'll know it's God's will. And then he did it and God did it. And what did he do the next day? Well, God, let me one more time put a fleece out. This time, let the ground be wet. Let the fleece be dry. We're not Gideon. Gideon didn't have a Bible. Gideon didn't have the Holy Ghost. He had an excuse to question God's will to do what he said. We have no excuse because we have, a, we have the Bible. We have the Holy Ghost. We have God's word, promises. We have history to read. We know already. We know we can know God's will by reading his word. And once we read his word and study, I would challenge you to study the issues of faith. Just take the word faith and go through the concordance and read every scripture on faith. You will be utterly shocked what you're missing. Everything of God's blessing and provision and promise is there just waiting to be apprehended by people who will simply act in faith on what God said without seeing any evidence. Remember, we walk by faith and not by sight. Sight has to see it and then they'll believe it. Jesus said, blessed are those who do not see and yet believe. In other words, the word says it. That's enough for me. I don't need a confirmation of two or three kinds. I don't need to put out a fleece. If God's word says it and God can't lie and I'm a believer, then I'm obligated to believe his word and I act upon it in that regard and I get results. Now, James 2, 20, listen what the word of God teaches us. And, and remember, we're looking at this in the context of faith, not just in salvation, but for all things. Verse 20, but will thou... Uh, oh, no, O oh vain man, that faith without works is dead. Now, that word works sometimes I think is confusing to us because the minute you say works, it's like there's this radar that Christians have. They hear the word works and they start getting in a frantic. Are you saying I have to work for salvation? No, nobody's teaching that. But there are works. And in this, if one, one translation or margin in the Bible says where that word works, it says corresponding actions, corresponding actions. So faith without corresponding actions is dead. Okay, so it's the equivalent today. People say, I know God can heal me. He could heal me. Okay, well, you know God could heal you. That's great. You don't know anything then because even non-believers uh, who, who aren't Christian, so to speak, would acknowledge God could heal you. He created the solar systems by the power of his word. Of course, he could heal you. Nobody is going to get healed as a Christian saying God could heal me if he wanted to. Now, when you say, God will heal me, God's willing to heal me, and you pray, believing you receive what you ask, you shall have whatsoever you say. So it's not enough to just mentally assent that God is able to bless you. God is able to speak to you. He said, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, but let him ask in faith without any wavering. It's not enough to say, I know God has all wisdom. Maybe I'll pray and he'll answer me. That's not enough. The Bible says to pray, believing that when you ask God for wisdom, he will give it to you liberally. That means freely and without reproach. But let him ask in faith without any doubting. Because if you ask in faith, you will not receive anything. So the issue of, of believing God is not mentally assenting to his power or ability. The question isn't, can God? The question is, will God heal me? Will God help me? Will God save my loved one? Will God deliver my son? Will God, you put your, your need there. Will God do it? Until we come to the, the understanding that it is God's will to do it and he will perform it once my faith says yes, then we pray in faith. Now, anything apart from that is mental assent. It's agreeing that God's able but not believing his willingness. And so he says, do you not know that faith without corresponding action is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works? Now you think, you think of that if it's in terms of salvation, that we have to go work then to be saved. Well, what if more than just applying this to salvation, what God's really saying is that when God spoke to Abraham, he gave his word. That word God gave to Abraham was as sure and steadfast as every word in the Bibles that we possess. When Abraham believed God, God said, go and I'll be with you. God said, put your son on the altar. God said, I'll make you a father of many nations. Every word God spoke to Abraham, Abraham had a decision. Am I going to believe? And notice, 
God gave some really challenging things to Abraham to believe and to, to actually follow, to leave his family, leave everything behind, to put his son after he waited all these hundred, a hundred years to get the son, the son of promise, to put him on the altar. God did not make it easy, the, the issue of faith. That's why Paul said, fight the good fight of faith. Faith is a fight because the things God calls us to aren't always easy, but they require us to operate out of a different mentality, not out of the intellect that doesn't make sense, but out of faith. Faith doesn't, we walk by faith and not by sight. In other words, we walk by faith and not our human senses, not the intellectual mind, but that other sense, that inner sense that believes what God said, he cannot lie. So Abraham believed what God told him, and even if it meant killing his only begotten son, he knew that God would raise him from the dead because God could not lie. Wow, with a man, and, and the Bible says, we who are of faith are of faithful Abraham. God's looking for more Abrahams. The, 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 the man Abraham transcends covenant. He's not old covenant. He was before the old covenant. The Bible says that we who are in the new covenant of faith are of Abraham. We're Abraham's seed. Jesus was Abraham's seed. The, the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham was through Christ. So what God waits for is those sons of Abraham, those daughters of Sarah, who simply believe the Bible to be absolutely true. No matter if our experience is saying, well, I prayed for somebody and they didn't get better, they got worse, or I tried that before and I didn't get results. Well, are, are you going to let your experience trump what the Word of God teaches? Or is the Word of God true and every man's a liar? The Word of God needs to be true. So Abraham believed God and he acted upon God's Word and he got results. Uh, I'm about out of time, I think, because my voice is going, but I'm going to give you some scriptures to study, and then we'll come back and pick up here. Look at James chapter 1. Uh, first, read through the rest of the, the James chapter 2, verse 20 through 23. Read the rest of that. The scripture was fulfilled. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him. When Abraham believed God's word, that was what was accounted to him for righteousness, and he became the friend of God. God is looking for people that don't need proof to step out on his, and act upon his word. Faith without corresponding action. In other words, you say God can do such and such and can do such, but you don't step out believing that it's for you, that it's for now, that he'll do it when you step out. So we stay safe. We, we, we play in the safe, in the shallows, saying God can, but I don't know if he will. And we, ex we, we just basically exclude ourselves from, from or, or we, we relieve ourselves of the burden of, re of responsibility to simply act upon what we believe with corresponding actions. So, it's a call to, to get in the Word and really study out the issue. What is God's will for the New Testament church? Is it just that we go to church and be nice? Of course not. Look no further than Mark chapter 16. And he said, these signs will follow them to believe. Not those that don't believe, but those that do believe. These signs will follow them. They'll speak with tongues. They'll cast out devils. They'll drink poison and it won't hurt them. They'll lay their hands on the sick and the sick shall recover. So God gives us clearly what his will is and what he's requiring for us to do by faith. If we're sitting around waiting on some sign that we're supposed to go out and do what Jesus said do, we'll wait for the rest of our life. God is waiting. We're not waiting on God. God is waiting on us to simply believe his word and then act upon it. If you need help from God, if you need power from God, if you need something, anything from God, you're responsible then to get in the word and see what the scripture says about that subject, about that need that you have, and then to act upon it, being fully assured that when you do your part, believe and receive, that God will do his part. Have whatsoever you say. Uh, a couple other chapters. Romans chapter 2, verse 13 says, not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers. Not the hearers, but the doers. Again, we can use that for salvation. You gotta be a doer, not a hearer. That's It, it, it fits there. But what about... All the other things that God tells us to do other than believe in Jesus and repent of our sins. He tells us of all kinds of intentions and promises and provisions that he makes available to the New Testament believer. It's up to us to believe those things and then step out in them. James 1.22 said, But be doers of the word and not just hearers only, deceiving your own self. So it's not enough to hear. It, you have to do. So he said, Faith without works is dead. Be doers and don't just be hearers, but act. So faith without corresponding action. Listen, in a nutshell, here's what I'm saying. God is looking for the church 
to simply come to terms with what his will is. Jesus said he only did what the Father did. He only said what the Father said. He only did what the Father did. He Every work that Jesus did was in total unity and in and, and the flow of the will of God. And once Jesus knew the will of God, he did it with absolute and total confidence and faith. That's what God's waiting for from us. If we're to be Christ-like, you know what God wants? He wants us to believe his word in the face of all impossibility and improbability. And when all of our senses are telling us, you're crazy for doing this. It doesn't make sense. You're not, you're, you're, you're not, you're not thinking clearly. When everything against us and people are telling us, well, you should really be careful. And are you sure this is God's will? And should you really be doing this? Or you're going to make a fool of yourself. The Christian is the person that is so sure of what God has said he will perform, that they act on the word of God in the face of all improbability. And Jesus and Father God brings us into situations of improbability for the very sure purpose of making us step out into the supernatural and believe God for provision. What what did God say about the 5,000 hungry people? You know, what did Jesus say? You feed them. They're like, how can we feed this multitude? And Jesus multiplied through supernatural activity. And then Peter, walking on water, and so many other cases where God puts them in improbable, in, if not impossible situations, and makes them believe God's word over what their eyes are telling them. That, my friends, is what awaits us. When we have faith in the word of God, we step into the impossible and do what God commands us in faith. Amen. I'll be coming live soon. This weekend, I'll be gone Friday and Saturday preaching in Florida, so I uh, may not come on before I go. I may. If not, I'll be on next week, and we'll continue speaking just on the subject of faith. My goal is to keep harping on these things, these subjects, and look, I am absolutely sure some of you are hearing some of the things I'm saying and questioning, like, is this this serious? Is he meaning this? I've never heard that before. Listen. Give it time. I'm, I'm going to come c- go back to the Word of God over and over and over and show you so many things and so many times where the Bible promises uh, provision, blessing, healing, deliverance, uh, all of your needs to be met. So many things. Peace. He promises us peace, unspeakable joy, full of glory, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the gifts of the Spirit, all of these promises that we don't seem to be apprehending because they can only be apprehended by faith. But once we build our faith, once we build our faith in what the Word of God says, when we begin to act on those, on our belief, on our faith, we're going to begin to see supernatural results. So stick with it. I love every one of you. Uh, God bless you. We'll talk very soon. Take care.